Mr. Chairman. In 2020, Hawaii had the lowest gun death rates and the third lowest rate of gun ownership in the entire country. Prior to Bruin, Hawaii police departments had only issued four licenses to carry in the past two decades. Following the court's decision, however, police departments across all counties in Hawaii have begun issuing licenses. As of December 2022, Hawaii County has issued 89 concealed gun licenses and Maui County has issued 18. Between 50,000 to 60,000 people are expected to apply for a concealed carry permit in upcoming years. State and local officials have expressed concerns that lax gun laws may lead to a rise in violent crime. Consequently, county police departments have implemented stronger requirements for applicants seeking licenses to carry. State and local legislators have also introduced gun safety measures, including an enacted law in Hawaii County designating sensitive places, such as churches, where firearms are prohibited. However, gun owners have stated their intent to challenge these gun legislations in court. In September 2022, the National Association for Gun Rights, NAC, NAGR, filed a lawsuit against the state of Hawaii seeking to overturn the state's ban on assault pistols and large capacity magazines. The NAGR is seeking to challenge the constitutionality of these laws under the court's new framework in Bruin. The organization had filed six other lawsuits against state and cities with assault rifle or large capacity magazine bans. So a question for Mr. Lindley. Do you think that the concern over the thousands and thousands of applicants who will now apply for licenses in Hawaii and that this could lead to a rise in violent crime, is, is that a misplaced concern? Do you agree with the concern of law enforcement in Hawaii? I do agree with those concerns, Senator. If you just looked at more guns equals safety, there's over 400 million firearms in the United mm -hmm. States. If that was the case, we should be the safest country in the world. So yeah. more guns is not the answer to safety. I agree with you. And the statistics I pointed to in Hawaii where we have some of the strictest gun safety laws and there is a cause and effect as to the um, use of guns in Hawaii in uh, violent situations. Ms. Glenn, you have spent almost 30 years as an advocate for domestic violence victims and have testified today on the impact of Bruin on intimate partner violence. Just last month, the Fifth Circuit, in the first major case to apply Bruin, found that portion of the Violence Against Women Act that prohibited the possession of firearms by those subject to certain domestic violence restraining orders violated the Second Amendment. This kind of restriction was a common sense of kind of restriction on violent abusers. How will interpretations of Bruin, like this one in the Fifth Circuit, make it harder to protect victims and survivors of domestic violence? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I think we go back to uh, my written testimony, which is there has to be some type of protection that is allowed before the violence escalates. So having um, a protection order that says that I can have a firearm removed from the situation so that I am safer, mm -hmm. safer is very, very critical. Well, I'd say under Bruin, maybe there's no historical basis for removal of a firearm in those kinds of circumstances. Professor Rubin, I, I really found it instructive uh, that uh, you said that uh, this decision um, is transforming the way litigation is looking and historians are being retained in cases. Justice Barrett and Bruin observed that the flaw of a historical approach to the Second Amendment and in the interpretation of the Constitution is that originalism is far from scientific. <laughs> I would agree with that. And, and sadly, though, she went, went ahead and agreed with the majority opinion in that case. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, Professor Bruin, in the wake of Bruin, you examined New York's proposed legislation to require gun owners to have express permission from property owners to carry guns in, onto their private property, including homes, restaurants, offices, and entertainment venues. Uh, do you think a, a law like that would withstand a Bruin challenge? 
So, Senator, that law is um, currently the subject of litigation, some adverse decisions currently on appeal. Um, the, the, there's a fundamental right to keep and bear arms, but it's important to recognize that there's also a fundamental right to private property. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in the Constitution that says that the right to keep and bear arms has to trump the private property rights um, of other people. And so one of the things that that law in New York does is it switches the default. Um, private property owners always have the ability to exclude people who are carrying gun if they, um, if they don't want that person on there. All it does is switches the default about who has to ask who about the private property owner's preferences. I applaud New York for their approach. And by the way, you know, before Heller, which was a 2008 decision, there was no uh, explicit, in my view, right for individuals to own guns and also to own whatever the guns they wanted. <laughs> Heller is a 2008 decision. How did we get along with the Second Amendment before then, I say? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Rono. Senator Cornyn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, I appreciate a legal